Kia ora and welcome to the next episode of the Language Fuel podcast. This is season three, episode three, and today we're just finishing off the interview with Jill Hadfield. Jill, as you've probably gathered by now, if you've seen the last two episodes, is our new content editor for the English language teaching training library. So today we finish off the interview with her. We pick up where she's uh, been in Madagascar for a couple of years and we talk a little bit of first about her um, charity that she started, uh, which is still going today and you can donate there. Uh, and then after that, we get into the phase of her career where she starts writing because she uh, chose to be at home with her daughter. Uh, she starts writing, writing lots of books. And then um, after that, she moves to New Zealand, which is, of course, where um, her life and mine connected many years ago, maybe 15 years ago. Uh, and, and we hear about the research that she's done since then. Um, and right at the very end, you will hear a little bit about what she hopes to achieve as content editor of our online ELT training library. I hope you enjoy the end of this podcast. It's a wee bit longer than the others, so I want to say more like 25 minutes rather than 10 to 15, um, but I think it's worth it. She's full of fantastic stories. She's had an amazing career. We're very lucky to have her. Don't forget, it's very, very close to the deadline for uh, entering the draw for our free annual membership to the ELT training library. Get in quick. Um, we will be drawing it on the 1st of March and we'll notify those via email, whoever has been successful. Enjoy the interview with Jill. Um, now, I happen to also know that while you were in Madagascar, uh, you were help, involved in helping set up a charity. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yes, it's a, it's a funny story. Um, as we went on, well, really right from the start, we became conscious that a lot of children weren't in school at all. Um, they were out on the streets begging. And sometimes we'd visit a class, and then a week or so later, we'd think, where have all the children gone? Because there were only half the number of children. <clears throat> and mm -hmm. some children put their lives on the street, but some, um, if, say, the harvest was bad or the parents ran out of money, the parents just kept them off school to, to beg. And... Yeah. It was, um, Charlie had this experience in the Ministry of Education going up with a, the stairs with a colleague and his colleague said, hey, would you like um, a samosa and bought him a snack? And Charlie said the staircase was sort of lined with eight-year-old kids selling trays of samosas. And Charlie yeah. said to his colleague, um, shouldn't these children be in school? And his colleague said, yeah, as if he'd never thought about it before or the boys were sort of invisible to him. So the more we stayed there, the more I wanted something to do something to help the kids who weren't in school. And I found this most amazing group of international nuns called um, the Little Sisters of the Good Shepherd. And they were, they were just amazing. They ran a soup kitchen. Um, they ran um, a soup kitchen, a um, milk and vitamins for old people and babies, um, mm -hmm. vaccination program, um, free medicine, um, free medical care, a clinic, and also um, uh, a school for street kids, which was 80 kids taught by a retired primary school teacher. In the wow. And, um, Were these local nuns, local from Madagascar themselves? No, from India, Ireland, I've forgotten where else. I, I knew Sister Lucy, who was Indian, and um, Sister Anna, who was um, Irish best. Okay. It, yeah. they, were, they were just lovely. Um, and uh, they said the problem was um, that they really needed to get the kids into um, a state school because um, they weren't really an official school. And the kids, if the kids went to state school, they could graduate with a diploma um, from primary school, which would help them get a job. Mm. Um, but state school cost money. Mm. Um, at the start, the kids had to have sort of equipment like books and pens, but there were also school fees. I mean, very um, small school fee, like a few dollars a year. But um, if you don't have anything, you didn't have it. Yeah. Mm. So um, I decided I'd make some money for them and just wrote to my friends in England um, who were absolutely wonderful. They had bake sales and they, they did wonderful things, including one lady, old lady, who was a friend of Charlie's aunt's, um, who was bedridden. And she wouldn't let any of her visitors leave her room um, unless they'd made a donation. Oh, she's fabulous. <laughs> Fantastic amount of money. And um, so all this money got sent to Madagascar. So I think since we started, we must have sent about 
over 3,000 kids to primary school. Because what, ha what happened um, when I got back to England, I found a charity called Money for Madagascar, which was um, started by a group of Quakers from Swansea meeting in Wales. And um, they had lots of very wonderful small scale projects like um, uh, reforestation, um, giving people startup grants um, to, to, to do, get them off their feet and um, small businesses and things like that. Like uh, just for example, there was going to be a new hotel built um, in the uh, rainforest in um, Eastern Madagascar and they gave local people, they gave one woman a start a startup grant to buy some chickens so she could sell eggs to the hotel. And they nice. gave, so it was, yeah. And it was trying to provide villagers with improved rice varieties and also teaching some um, less, I suppose, less destructive methods of planting rice because Madagascar, they um, use slash and burn. Um, oh. they, uh, they burn down a hillside and then plant the rice. But it only takes a year or two for the, um, the rains to leach the soil and they can't grow anything on that hillside anymore. So they go and burn mm. up. A different one, yeah. We did meet actually at one point, um, fantastic um, uh, monk, I suppose he was. A, 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 no, a priest, a, a Jesuit priest. Um, we went on a, um, a walking uh, tour with, with two friends. He was French and she was Malagasy. And we went to, um, around the villages in the high plateau, um, in the mountainous hilly country in the middle of Madagascar. And um, everywhere we went, the children wanted photos taken in all the villages. And with photos with the white people sort of thing? Is that what you mean? Just of them. Um, oh, oh, they wanted themselves to be in photos. Yes. Oh, yes. okay. <laughs> and we asked, um, but how will we get the photos to you? Um, and the answer was, in every case, it was, um, oh, take them to Père Curo and he'll know, he'll know what to do with them. That's the, um, the the priest. The priest, yes. Right. And um, everywhere we went, we saw um, rice paddies, um, you know, terraced rice. Yes. Um, yeah. Eating sort of single-handedly kind of crusading for making um, uh, paddy rice. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't erode the hillsides and is more, more stable, more permanent. So when yeah. we got back to the nearest town, um, we went in search of him. And um, our friend Daniel wanted to give each school um, a football um, and, yeah. and a blackboard. I think we saw schools without blackboards. So yeah. Kyoho said the blackboard is fine, but the, the um, footballs, they'll have to work for them. He said, um, they'll have to plant a thousand trees to get a football. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he obviously sort of ran, ran those villages. And yeah, tight, quite a tight ship going on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, Madagascar is full of, full of characters like that. Um, so how long were you there in total in Madagascar? Two years. Two yeah. years. So, yeah. Two, two years from getting people, but it was a two-year project. Yeah. Um, I should say the charity, if anybody's interested. Yes, please, tell us. Money for Madagascar. And, it's and we can find that online? Yes, www.moneyformadagascar.com. Cool. And I'll put a link. Inspiring stories about it was, yeah. And it was okay. trying to provide villagers with improved rice varieties and also teaching some um, less, I suppose, less destructive methods of planting rice because Madagascar, they um, use slash and burn. Um, oh. they, uh, they burn down a hillside and then plant the rice, but it only takes a year or two for the, um, the rains to leach the soil and they can't grow anything on that hillside anymore, so they go and burn mm. up. A different one, yeah. We did meet actually at one point um, fantastic um, uh, monk, I suppose he was. A, 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 no, a priest, a, a Jesuit priest. Um, we went on a, um, a walking uh, tour with, with two friends. He was French and she was Malagasy. And we went to um, around the villages in the high plateau, um, in the mountainous hilly country in the middle of Madagascar. And um, everywhere we went, the children wanted photos taken in all the villages. Um, with photos with the white people sort of thing? Is that what you mean? Just of them. Um, oh, oh, they wanted themselves to be in photos. Yes. Oh, yes. okay. <laughs> and we asked, um, but how will we get the photos to you? Um, and the answer was in every case, it was, um, oh, take them to Père Curo and he'll know, he'll know what to do with them. 
That's the, um, the, the priest. The priest, yes. Right. And um, everywhere we went, we saw um, rice paddies, um, you know, terraced rice. Yes. Yeah. People sort of single-handedly kind of crusading for making um, uh, paddy rice. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't erode the hillsides and is more, more stable, more permanent. So when yeah. we got back to the nearest town, um, we went in search of him. And um, our friend Danielle wanted to give each school um, a football um, and, yeah. and a blackboard. I think we saw schools without blackboards. So yeah. Kyoho said, the blackboard is fine, but the, the um, footballs, they'll have to work for them. He said, um, they'll have to plant a thousand trees to get a football. Wow. <laughs> So um, he obviously sort of ran, ran those villages. And yeah, tight, quite a tight ship going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, wow. yeah Madagascar is, is full, of, full of characters like that. So how long were you there in total in Madagascar? Two years. Yeah. Two years. So, yeah. Two, two years from getting to, but it was a two-year project. Yeah. Um, I should say the charity, if anybody's interested. Yes, please, tell us. Money for Madagascar. And, it's and we can find that online? Yes, www.moneyformadagascar.com. Cool. I'll put a link. Inspiring stories about what they do. It's, uh, it's great. Fabulous. I love the fact that it's, you know, really um, well balanced, you know, a bit of agriculture, a bit of business, a bit of education. Like it's, it's the whole thing. You can't just sort of do one and ignore everything else. So. Yes. Yeah. That's um, great. Yeah. Lovely, lovely. And then so now after Madagascar, what, what was the next? Was New Zealand straight away? No, I'm just trying to. I have, I've lost track of the time. So. Um, we were back in England for about nine years and mm -hmm. my daughter was born. Uh, yep. And um, I, I became freelance. I started just, just writing. Um, yep. yep. While, while Laura was, it, it fitted in very well while Laura was small. For sure. Yeah. And then I moved to New Zealand in the early 2000s at some point. When we were about 2004-ish? Three. Yeah, three. And I started work at Unitech in 2004. Right. Yep. Cool. And I remember thinking, I don't know if I've ever told you this, Jill, but I remember when, when Unitech hired you because I had known your books, you know, it was part of my training and, you know, we'd certainly use all the games and things like that. I remember thinking, Unitech is so lucky to have Jill. Like, what a boon for the organisation. And here I am, you know, 20 years later, however long it is, 15, I suppose, and 14, 15, um, and we're working together under language field. So I, I feel very privileged to have someone of your calibre working with us. <laughs> Um, speaking of books, since we kind of talked about, you know, when you be with your daughter having arrived and you started doing um, more writing and freelancing and stuff, what was the very first book that you wrote? Right. Charlie and I um, wrote a book together. With, um, Charlie did his dissertation at London University on teaching writing. Yep. And, um, his tutor, um, Anita Pincus, invited us both to write a book with her. She was writing mm. a series. Um, called Writing in English. So Writing English Book 3 was the first book we wrote, which was with Anita Pincus. With it, wow. Um, and then the second book was Elementary Communication Games. Which yes. I guess no, possible. that was quite successful because I'm pretty sure, wasn't it? Because, I mean, that's the one... I assume everybody knows it. I don't know, but it's certainly in the circles that I have worked with. Everybody sort of knows that one. Yes. How did you come up with the ideas? Like, I mean, to, for such a successful book, how did, how did it come about? Um, it came about, my editor at Macmillan for the Writing in English series was married to an editor at Harrop. And um, I first of all start, they asked me to do a proposal for um, a course book. And I wrote in a couple of samples and I wanted to end every unit with a game. Um, <laughs> And in the end, they said, well, we've decided not to go ahead with the course book, but oh. would you be interested in doing game, a book of games? So I said, oh, I'd love to. Better than the course book, in fact. Um, yeah, yeah. I had quite precise ideas on how I wanted it done. I wanted it A4 and spiral bound so it would lie flat on a, copy, a photocopy. Okay. So um, useful, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and yes, I guess it was, yeah, it was pretty, I guess it was pretty successful because they asked me to do... Um, you know, lots of other games books in the series. Mm. And then other publishers got hold of the idea um, some way down the line, actually, and started making photocopyable books as well. So, Interesting. I didn't realise you were sort of, that, that was kind of your idea because I, um, 
you know, as part of what we do at Language Fuel, you know, with the resource room, there are a number of books that are formatted that way in terms of the spiral bound because it is so good for photocopying and they're very popular. And I guess I had never thought, well, someone will have had to think of this first, you know, <laughs> I sort of take that for granted. So maybe we should be thanking you for the photocopyability of our teaching resources. <laughs> Certainly the first photocopyable one in, in, in ELT, but I, mm. I can't vouch for, you know, other, other subjects. There may well be science resources or something somewhere yeah yeah for sure um speaking of the books you've written is there one that stands out to you or maybe one or two that are kind of the more of the interesting ones or most interesting ones that you can think about well i obviously have a sort of soft spot for the games books um mm. I, I love um both playing and um and uh writing games um I think I was have quite a soft spot for group dynamics because that was um, it was the first book to consider that subject, mm. how important it was in the classroom. And I also felt a very kind of direct link to teachers because we didn't, didn't start as a book on group dynamics. It started as a book on, um, it was going to be on learning strategies or um, think, yeah, thinking, thinking strategies, I think. Um, so how the learner thinks. It's called it? learner training, sorry, but I don't okay. think about that anymore. Um, so as part of that, I started with a colleague, Angie Maldarez. We sent a questionnaire out to um, language schools all over England and in Europe as well. And um, asking teachers to write down what they felt when they came out of a lesson that they'd been very happy with. Mm. We were expecting lots of things like... Um, oh, students find it difficult to understand the present perfect or students don't retain vocabulary items. And we were thinking we'd write learner training materials to help with those problems. But we got quite mm. a surprise when they came back because I'd say 99% of the replies were about group dynamics. Wow. The typical comment that came up again and again and again was my group just doesn't gel. Wow. And um, so by this time, Angie had gone to... Um, She'd gone to Cyprus, that's right, to teach in northern Cyprus, and she it was a very time-consuming job, and she said, I don't think I've got the time to do it, so I soldiered on on my own. And so the first thing I did was classify all the replies I'd got into categories. So people would say things like, um, students are very bad at listening to each other, or um, um, uh, students um, happy to talk, but they're not very interested in what the other person has to say, things like that. Um, I think my favorite comment was, what do you do with the indigestible group member? <laughs> That's a lovely description. <laughs> and I know exactly what they mean, right? We've all had that one person who's like, ah, driving me crazy. Yeah. So I then um, divided it into categories. And from this negative list of things that went wrong with groups, I tried to think, well, what could you do to counteract that? How could you make the group a better place? So yep. I devised my chapter en entries on, uh, chapter titles on that basis. Um, uh, so we had things like uh, creating more empathy, um, uh, learning to listen, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, crisis management or dealing with difficulties. That was the indigestible group member. Um, mm -hmm. uh, what happens if a group breaks down and they really don't, you know, what do you do? Mm -hmm. so, most of the strategies were trying to preempt difficulties, but there, there's a final chapter called Dealing with Difficulties. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, felt like, it was pure pleasure to write. I wrote it in about three weeks. Wow, that's it, amazing. It longer because, you know, there were revisions and stuff. But, sure. Yeah, it was, um, once I got the framework in place, it was, um, it was, it was great. That's amazing. And is that still for sale now? I'm just trying to think. I can't, I don't know. It's... Um, it's OUP um, in the Resource Books for Teachers series, which that's come to an end. They're not take, publishing any more titles, but I think the titles they've got are still, are still for sale. Yep, sounds like a, a fabulous book. I'm not sure that I've seen it myself, but I'm desperate now to get my hands on a copy. Because, you know, still um, in Facebook groups and things like that, I see teachers a lot talking about that. And they might call it something slightly different, classroom management or whatever, behaviour management. But it's the same kind of thing. I think when someone feels comfortable in the group, they'll settle, you know, and so it's, um, it's the same thing in a different kind of frame. Yeah. 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 There's a lot of activities there for creating a group. Um, 
I get, uh, for example, there's one called Group History, which introduces to the group the idea that they in some way existed as a group before they even met. Wow. And the history, starting with the, um, the date the oldest person in the group was born, right up to the present. So you might get something like, I don't know, um, 1990, um, Alicia was born. 1991, um, Alicia, I don't know, did something... Um, uh, uh, Solomon was conceived. <laughs> um, yeah. and then it goes, it goes on through that, you know, by the time you've got to sort of five or seven years in, a lot of things are happening. You know, um, Zachary moved house, um, Ruth, Ruth went to school, started school, you know, and you get a sense of um, what everybody in the group was doing in the years before they actually met as a group. And that sort of creates a kind of bonding. Yeah, well, you certainly get to know people extremely well and, and develop a respect for what they bring to the group. If nothing else, that's, you know, a fantastic place to start. Wow, that's awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, and what about the most recent one? I know you've published one very recently. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, not very, very, but... Yes, about um, a bit over a year ago, perhaps 18 mm -hmm. months ago, um, I published a book with, I wrote with Lindsay Canfield, who's um, a very prolific ELT author, author of probably the most famous one is Global English. Um, mm. He's a Canadian living in southern Spain. Trilingual children, I think. Um, Interaction Online. Um, I'm quite proud of it, as it was a finalist in both the Ben Warren Prize and um, the Eltons for mm -hmm. innovation in teacher resources. Um, and we started thinking... Um, Technology is used a lot in education now in ELT, but um, what it's mostly used for is um, uh, programs that promote interaction between human and machine. Um, and we wanted to have some interaction between human and human, as you do on Facebook, for example, or as we are. Yeah. Um, so there were loads of resources um, available on the internet and also online components in course books um, that promoted uh, what we called weak interaction, which was human to machine. And we wanted to promote strong interaction, which we call human to human. Um, mm -hmm. That gives a number of um, interactive activities, online chat activities. You could do it in Facebook, for example, or WhatsApp or Edmodo. Moodle would be no good for it because it's not uh, quick enough. You have to kind of delve into other people's forum postings and mm -hmm. you can't see everybody's all the time. So... Um, we trialed it in a number of things, um, uh, Lefora, Edmodo, WhatsApp, Facebook. Um, I personally found it worked best on Facebook because it's just so easy. Um, and you can create a closed group on Facebook that nobody else can see mm. and nobody else can join. A closed and secret group. So only the people um, in, in, your, um, in your group that you're working with uh, can, can be in. So it's just a number of... Um, uh, chat, chatting activities um, to promote, uh, to practice various language points or on particular topics. Um, so we divided them into five chapters. Um, personal, which is exchanging personal information. Factual, which are kind of mostly quizzes or guessing games about um, um, factual things. Critical, which is discussion, um, debate uh, type activities. Creative is where um, the participants work together to create a product like an advert for example or a poem or a short story um there's one for example is a collaborative story where they're given a scenario and they have to kind of um be a character in that scenario and sort of interact with each other as the characters and the last one is fanciful which is role plays and various fanciful. Nice. so for example there's in the fanciful category um one example is uh, called almost superpower so the first um, student A or student A begins and types in, um, or the teacher begins it actually, the teacher types in, I can fly. Um, and the students have to race to be the first person to limit that superpower. So say student A right, is, gets there first and types in, but you can only fly one meter off the ground. <laughs> and then stu the student who limits that superpower, student A, has to then post something himself. Um, I can read people's thoughts. And then another student comes in, student B comes in and says, but you can only read the nasty ones. <laughs> and so, it's sort of a chain of interactions yeah, and the next person yeah. has to limit the pre previous one. Yeah. And one thing I've been doing um, 
is running a couple of workshops at conferences um, about how interactions online have very different interaction patterns from, from in the class. Mm -hmm. That one I called Pass the Parcel because you're, it's, it's, it's a kind of chain one. Um, mm. There are others I've given fanciful names to, like confetti. That's when somebody, say, posts a picture and everybody reacts. Everybody says stuff, yeah. The bride comes out and you throw confetti. Yeah. yeah. So they're, they're quite, quite different interaction patterns. It's been quite interesting to sort of um, look at how um, yeah, interact activity types are quite different online. So that's mm. a very interesting book to write. Fun. That's awesome. It's a load of fun as well. Yeah. yeah. And how about now? Are you writing something at the moment? Yes, I'm writing a level of a, a couple of levels. I've just finished one level and on to the last level now of a primary course. And um, I do like writing primary materials. They're fun. You have to make up stories, which is always nice. And in this one, the kids have a magic wand, which can take them um, to a different countries, but also back in time. Nice. As well. They've been to um, a number of places. Yeah, yeah, it's nice. It's, um, yeah. Fun, fun, fun. fun. Um, now, one question I had is, you know, you've done so many things in your career. You've written lots of books. You've trained lots of teachers. Um, as time has gone on, what have you noticed that's changed over the time? We talked a little bit before about the technology, right, from having no resources and having to learn how to draw pictures and those Googling things. So what, what other things have you noticed? I was, yeah, I think quite a lot of things have endured. I mean, when I started teaching, the sort of communicative approach was quite new, but that's, that's still with us. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the years before that, methods came and went like crazy. You know, there was right. a method, there was a silent way, all those designer methodologies. Um, then there was um, audio lingual came and went, but the communicative approach has sort of been quite a constant. Um, mm -hmm. um, uh, I think in the course books have got much more complicated um, mm -hmm. strands, you know, online components and um, various lo loads more components. And also they've got more complicated. A lot of them at the moment are writing in a, a syllabus, um, the 21st century syllabus. Have you heard of this? Before? I have. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Creativity, critical thinking, cooperation and collaboration, I think are the four mm -hmm. And you supposed to weave these in um, as well as so as well as the ELT content there's a sort of um, thinking skills component and creativity mm -hmm. component. Um, I would I mean the outstanding thing is technology you know we have touched mm -hmm. on that before um, not only do course books have sort of online components but more people are teaching online more people are doing blended learning um, there's such an amazing wealth of technology around you couldn't you know very difficult to keep up with it. Um, yeah, it is difficult to keep up. You're right. Yeah. Mm. yeah. But yeah. Cool. And um, my very last question for you, so um, getting on in time there, is in your brand new role as the Language Your ELD content editor, what kinds of things are you going to be doing? How can we benefit from your years and wealth of experience and understanding, I guess is the point. How can our listeners benefit from that? Well, at the moment, I'm just. Um, very briefly looking at how the activities are classified and whether we could um, provide more ways in for teachers to decide what would be beneficial for them. Um, I'm then going to be looking um, for gaps in the current range of materials, gaps we could fill. Um, so for example, there's a lot at the moment on pronunciation and um, grammar uh, are two big categories. Um, as some other categories could, uh, we could fill in a bit and we could start some brand new categories. Mm, excellent. Thinking about different contexts of language learning, um, mm -hmm. like online and one-to-one, um, -one and um, young learners and teach, teaching with no resources even. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's one category we could look at. Um, I want to look for more authors, um, and I'm going to look carefully at writing a brief for the authors, uh, or even a template for them to write the short courses in. And yes, I guess um, encouraging authors to contribute um, and looking what they contribute and making reading the content and making suggestions. Perfect. 
I love the fact that, you know, you are, you do have this wide ranging experience and even, you know, your writing has touched so many subjects. So, you know, we benefit from that because you can say, oh, we haven't got anything on this and we haven't got anything on that. So it's, it's wonderful. So our, our members will, will certainly benefit from you going, oh, let's make sure that we've got some instruction and, and help in the, these different areas. So I'm really looking forward to working with you over the coming months in years and just you know getting getting our stuff really professional and you know well built out and well rounded it's great to have you on board and thank you so much for sharing all your stories you've got a huge amount of stories and it's i always love talking to you so um, yeah thank you and thank you for your time today great to talk so there you have it that's the end of our interview with jill hadfield i hope you have enjoyed this little mini series of getting to know jill a little bit better Hopefully that will give you confidence that uh, we are going into a fantastic territory in the next sort of year or two where Jill will be guiding our content, um, helping us have some fantastic new authors, contributing material and kind of fleshing out what we've got there. Um, once again, quick final last reminder, uh, if you're interested in uh, getting a free membership to the ELT Training Library for a year, you have probably about one more day to enter. We will draw on the 1st of March. So head on over to www.languagefuel.com slash celebrate Jill. Kaki Tiana, we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Language Fuel podcast. For more episodes and to learn what we do at Language Fuel, please visit www.languagefuel.com.